You're just going to fillet this sucker right off the bone. Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Fish Out Northwest, waiting on Tommy Donlan. This is what you call a bait stop. Welcome to Fish Out Northwest, Wayne England, Tommy Donlin, uh, coming to you live from the studio this week. We are we're back in the studio. We took a week off. Yeah, at the lovely shores of Summit Lake. How about that? Yeah, we're still here. So, um, yeah, glad to be back in studio. It was nice to have a week off last week. Put mm -hmm. a put a you know, kind of a pre uh, pre what edited show up for. Yeah, uh, the it wasn't really show. a week off. We just. Just shifted our focus for a couple days. So we didn't have time to jump in studio live, because yeah. you're right. We didn't have a week off. We were busy. Yes. You were busy. I was busy. We're on the road doing different That's things. That's right. I went west. You went east. I did. Yep. I did. Uh, man, I hit the road. We're going to get into all that later on as we move forward here. Uh, glad you could all uh, jump back in this evening and, and see us here live as we uh, bring you the show each, mostly each and every Thursday, 6 p.m. So it's go time. And once again, we have a lot of things to get caught up on, Tommy. And mm -hmm. part of that is just you and I out creating content and bring it to the people. Absolutely. <laughs> so, uh, hey, before we get too far along, as we do each and every week, I want to remind everybody, and you got to start taking advantage of this stuff. Go to our webpage, www.fishhuntnw.com. There you will find the Edge Rods coupon, FHN20. You're going to save 20% off all fishing rods at Edge Rods at checkout by simply entering FHN20 as your coupon code. Any rods that are not previously uh, connected to another special, um, you're going to save 20% on your entire purchase. That is a heck of a deal. Then, of course, we've teamed up with Phelps, Phelps Game Calls. Go to uh, their website through the entire year. Enter Fish Hunt 10 at the checkout with Phelps Game Calls. You're gonna save 20, uh, 10% off all Phelps Game Calls for the entire year. So, I mean, if you got all the turkey calls you need and you got elk on the horizon, you gotta start thinking. And, you know, waterfowl, doesn't matter, predator mm -hmm. calls. They got the whole line now, Tommy. Guys need to take advantage of this. You definitely need to start taking advantage of these edge rods because you're not gonna find anywhere else you're saving 20%. So, nice to see a lot of people signing on here. Uh, we'll try to interact with you folks as much as we can. Good to see you guys. The regulars are on here, Tommy, as per usual, so that's good. Yep. yep. Um, hey, I had uh, wanted to remind everybody, believe it or not, it's, it's getting close, man. We got a couple weeks. Kids Fishing Derby. Yes. Fish on Northwest, Summer Lake Community, Kids Fishing Derby. The Kids Trout Derby is coming up May 20th here at the Summit Lake Community Center is where we're hosting it. Uh, a lot of really amazing things going on. Uh, Ryan Elwell has been fantastic with Mission Outdoors. We're bringing the food. They're bringing the food. Free lunch, free breakfast, right, for everybody that shows up. Mm -hmm. Free food all day long. Um, got Are a we able to swing the trout pond? That's what we I We got the kids' trout pond. That's we, awesome. We got the kids' trout pond. WDFW yep. is planting 250 trout in the kids' trout pond at the That's facility. That's awesome. That kids five and under, moms, dads, single parents, whatever, you got little ones five and under, you want to bring them fishing, we'll have poles, we have bait, they're going to catch fish, they're going to win prizes. That's all great. All right there at the facility. Awesome. Right? So uh, kids five and over up to age 14 participate in the derby out on the lake, and uh, we're hoping to have a great turnout, lots of prizes, lots of, uh, lots of things to give away. Uh, next week, going to run down a list of the sponsors, mm -hmm. all those that are contributing because it's a host of them. And this is going to be a fantastic event once again. And I'm pretty sure uh, we can anticipate a, a great turnout. Mm -hmm. Also, we've teamed up with the church, the Summit Lake Community Church. We got parking attendants. So, uh, folks, if you bring your trucks and your boats, you get done fishing, want to stay for the awards with your kids, as you should, you don't have to worry about trying to get the boat home and then come back. Your gear and everything's going to be protected. We'll That's have great. four or five uh, parking lot attendants. They're going to they're going to pull you in there with your trucks and boats. You can leave all your stuff. Mm -hmm. We got eyes on it for you. Nothing to worry about. Stress free. Perfect. So 
show up and enjoy, and we're going to have a really good time. So looking forward to that. Um, if any of you still want to uh, help out or participate in uh, volunteering, just get a hold of us on Facebook, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you an assignment because there's plenty to do. So, all right, uh, running down the show, and we got a lot to get through, that is for sure. Um, spent this last week out there getting a lot of content put together, Tommy. We're going to bring some of that out uh, tonight. Uh, FHN on the beach digging clams, how to find them and actually how to dig them. Some pointers there to help you be successful. Then we're going to be back here in the kitchen. Uh, often are asked, how do you clean clams? I've never done it before. Well, there's a method to the madness. Going to show you how easy it is and how to get the most bang for your buck. Uh, we had a May 1st opener on Puget Sound, Tommy, as you and I are well aware of. Uh, Puget Sound Ling Cod did, in fact, open May 1st. You and I will have a little discussion on how well it's fishing and some tips for folks that might be struggling, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you, following up on that, you were back in the bait lab, going to get uh, down and dirty on some Ling Cod tricks here. Your Ling Cod double rig, really show the folks some uh, excellent rigging technique points so they can also be successful. Uh, then we're going to take a little time and discuss and recap the east side turkey hunt that I just returned from. Did I get a trophy bird? Did we get a trophy bird? Uh, I think so. We're going to talk about that, yeah, yeah for sure. And then uh, you guys had a fantastic weekend out there, out of Nia Bay. Little ones on the ocean, man. Yeah, you had eight, a... eight kids, and three of them were one-year-olds. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> on the ocean. So we, we're going to spend a little time talking about the value in that family time, mm -hmm. how you can pull that off, and, of course, do it safely. Yep, right? absolutely. Because everybody had a great time. So, all right, lots to get through. Don't go anywhere. We come back. We're going to be out there on the beach digging clams. Then we're going to show you how to clean them. All that going on. So stick around. Jump back in here right after this break right here at Fish on Northwest. The Fines Marine is the one-stop shop for the Pacific Northwest Angler. Defiance Marine guarantees the best price on a new and best service on a repower for your current boat. Defiance Marine is a Honda Premier dealership and one of the largest on the West Coast. Defiance Marine is a boat dealer who proudly sells Defiance, Allied, and Arima boats. All boats are built by West Coast fishermen for West Coast fishermen. Defiance Marine has all your boating needs to help you get out on the water. If you're looking for the best fishing rods in the world, you really do need to take a look at the edge rods. I designed and built new machinery, and I think this new machinery has enabled us to build blanks like no other company can build without this equipment. There is no other rods in the world that are as good as these rods. You owe it to yourself to take a good look at them. For more than 90 years, you've entrusted one brand to guide you towards living the lifestyle you've always dreamed of. Now you can entrust affiliated Better Homes and Gardens real estate professionals to interpret your needs and help you find the home in which to live your dream through every stage of your home buying or selling process. And through every stage of your life, there's Better Homes and Gardens real estate. Expect better. You ready to go do this? I'm ready. Hey guys, Dwayne England Fish on Northwest. Got my buddy Chris with me and uh, Matt, of course, behind the camera. We are out here on the beach. It is a clam dig day. The weather's fantastic. Finally got a break. It's beautiful. The clam reports are off the charts. We get 20 clams per person. Pretty lucrative limit. So not only today are we going to show you how to find them, how to dig them. Eventually, we're going to show you how to clean them. Here we go. So one thing I found in the past is like you walk along the beach and there's been guys doing that and you go, look at all these shows, <laughs> right? 
Diversion. Diversion. All right, uh, a little safety tip. When we're out here digging clams, this is not the appropriate direction for me to stand. Surf behind me, waves breaking to my back, washing my feet out from under me, exactly what I do not want to do. When I'm digging clams, I'm facing the surf, always paying attention to the waves coming in so I don't get knocked off my feet. He already squirted, there you go. Going deep. Here he is. Nice. You can utilize different methods. Stomping on the sand to get them to show. I like to use uh, a, you know, a stick, a uh, staff, if you will. I got it tethered to me, so when I do find a clam, I can simply throw it down, dig the clam, and it's not gonna float away. But there's just some uh, tools that you can utilize to find the clams in the sand and uh, makes it a much more efficient way to locate them. Oh, there we go. Oh. There he is. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh-huh. <sighs> yeah. Oh, that one, uh, felt a little shell on that one. Yep, I got him. Finally busted one. All right, guys, one thing to think about is every once in a while, we're gonna break a clam, all right? We're gonna hit it with the clam gun. It happens. I think I broke two of them today out of 20, not too bad. One thing I can tell you is the way to prevent breaking clams with your clam gun is as I'm facing the surf and I've identified a clam that I wanna go after, I put the clam gun in at a slight angle away from my body as I go down into the sand, okay? A slight angle because of the direction the clams are in the sand. They're not straight up and down, they're slightly tilted towards the beach. If the clam gun goes straight down, you're gonna cut them. If this clam gun goes in at an angle, oftentimes you surround the clam, extract it, no broken shell. All right, buddy, what do you think? That was quick. Oh man, uh, 20 clam limit per person. We got our 60 clams with Matt here in about 30 minutes or so. Hardly any people out here. That's a bit minimal crowd. We got out here late, 30 minutes, we're done. Tons of clams, plenty of opportunity left throughout the spring and summer. Check WDFW regs to find out where and when. We're getting out of here. Let's get home and show you guys next how to process your clams, clean them, and freeze them properly. Allied, the new leader in heavy gauge aluminum boats. Allied boats have standard reverse china and lifting rakes to help you plane faster and run at lower RPMs. Allied boats have several models to choose from, ranging from a 19-foot Mustang all the way up to a 32-foot Liberator. So regardless of what type of heavy gauge aluminum boats you are looking for, Allied boats will have it for you.
Contact Allied Boats today to learn more about these incredible fishing machines. All right, guys, well, here we go. Matt and I just returned from a great morning of digging clams, and now we're actually gonna show you how to process them on through, how to get them to open up in their shell in a, in a hot water bath, cool them in ice, and then ultimately how to clean them so you can either cook them up and or store them in the freezer. First part is to take all these clams. We got 40 because we got two limits, and they go into the boiling pot. Um, now, you might think we're blanching them because they're going into a pot for a couple minutes, but actually it's about 30 seconds or so. And the shells open up, then you can take the entire clam, the meat, the neck, the guts, the whole thing, right out of the clam shell. Just like that. And it goes right into an ice bath. That ice bath stops that cooking process. If you take them out of the hot boiling water and just put them into a, another uh, bowl of water that hasn't been chilled down with ice, they may toughen up a little bit. They may get a little toughness to them because you haven't stopped the cooking, cooking process. So we don't want to cook our clams right now. We just want to get them opened up and out of the shell. Next step in the process, final step of the process, as far as cleaning, we got all our clams, all 40 clams, basically here in the ice bath, they're nice and chilled. We're just taking the clam out one at a time. And now the key here, the goal, is to separate the main body of the clam, trim the neck, get the shoe off, and get all the guts or entrails out of the clam, separate out the meat. Pretty simple process. First thing we do is we cut the very tip of the neck off. Now, if you like to fish for surf purge, excellent bait for surf purge. So make sure you hang on to those, okay? Next thing we do is I like to just run up the zipper here with scissors. Now you can use knives, you can use scissors. I like big uh, shears here in the kitchen. We're gonna cut that neck laterally, and then we're gonna do it a second time down the center. It completely opens that neck up. You got two layers in there that you need to get to. Now we're just gonna chase the shoe around, around the gills, basically separating the clam body from the shoe and the guts. Okay, so now we're just trimming, that's the main body off of there, all right? Now that's the shoe and the guts. Here's the main body of the clam. That one's separated off of there, so now I'm gonna clean that all up. Wash off all the excess sand, any extra guts or gills, anything that might be on there. There you go, we got that all nice and trimmed up and clean. Now we go back to the shoe, 
You can see we have a gut line basically here. I just kind of go at a 45 at the bottom of the shoe. You'll see inside of it is the remainder of guts and a whole lot of fat. This thing is packed with fat. We just want to open that shoe up on both ends. Basically lay it wide open so you can get all this cleaned out of there. Now, the guts definitely, for some people, they like to keep a good amount of that fat on the shoe for frying up or whatever. It adds extra flavor. It adds uh, extra fullness to it, like you fry it up in a, a fritter or something. But uh, I tend to wash off a good amount of that. Although, there is actually quite a bit left on the shoe when you're done. And again, you can leave as much on there as you want. It, uh, it's edible, it's part of the shoe, it adds flavor, and that is your thickest cut of meat off your clam that fries up really nice. All right, well, there you go. 40 clams, processed, gutted, clean, bagged up. Uh, half of these are going with Matt and I to the east side for a clam fry, looking forward to that. The rest go into the freezer for a later date. Also kept all the guts out of the clams. Gonna freeze that in a bag and use that later this season for crab bait. Clam guts make fantastic crab bait, so make sure you give that a go. And of course, we already talked about the tips of the necks. Very durable bait for surf perch fishing. Works fantastic. Don't discard those if you plan to do any surf perch fishing. All right, with that, uh, pretty much does it for us. Out there getting clams today and showing you this entire process. Hopefully you enjoy it. We're gonna jump out for a quick break. We'll be back in studio right after this. Sportco and Outdoor Emporium is the largest local outfitter in the Northwest since 1975, providing thousands of people affordable outdoor gear. This summer, make your next outdoor adventure more affordable by shopping at our warehouse style pricing. We are a local Scotty dealer offering sales, service, and repair. Located in Fife and Seattle, come visit us today. The outdoors await you. McCombie's Custom Lures are made in the Northwest for salmon, steelhead, lake trout, and kokanee. Our products come in a variety of sizes and colors to help you catch more fish. Find our products in stores or at McCombie'sCustomLures.com. Yep, for sure. Oh, yeah. Big fish. Yeah, buddy. Nice fish. Oh, beauty. Gorgeous fish. Bobby's on the board. We got a good one. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, good. oh, oh. Oh, geez, come on. Nice fish. Nice fish. We're going to show you how to make fishing reels. All right, well, welcome back here in studio. Uh, what'd you think about that little outing, huh? That was really good. I've never, so I've never done it. Yeah. Right, usually because I'm I'm off doing something else, chasing some other quarry, but- uh, <laughs> There's too much to do. That was really informative. I've never seen one cleaned. Mm -hmm. So that was really cool to see that. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that you blanched them, because yeah. you know, I've, I've caught, you know, butters yep. and, and manilas yep. and little necks and stuff like that, you know, and it's completely different. Yeah. Yeah. And so that that was cool to see. And then your walking stick, yeah. you know, I, when I first saw it on the video, I thought, you know, you're just getting up there. Just in age, getting old. So yes. you need something to help a you get assist, along, especially the, out in the wind and yeah, the surf. It's like yeah. I gotta, you know, next find next your thing, way. Be out there right, in my cart. Right. Yeah. But no, that was cart. great. That was good. Yeah. Well, it's uh, for those that have never done it. I mean, you gotta first you gotta be able to figure out what am I looking for. Right. We literally most times I go out there clamming, people come up and go, what am I looking for? Right. Yeah. And. Guys that take a staff or a stick or some or the butt end of a clam shovel and you're 
banging into the sand, you're leaving mm -hmm. a little depression. Mm -hmm. And that's why I kind of joke yeah. at the start. Yeah. You know, it's go, oh my gosh, look at all these shows. Well, no, actually, they're just, right. you know. As you're depressed. walking behind the person in front of you yes. that's, that's <laughs> tapping the sand with their stick. Yeah. Good point. Right. good point. So right. anyway, uh, successful again, you know, so many clams. And we have clam digs right now starting today for the next two weeks, morning digs. Yeah. Uh, we're going to get out a couple more times. And hey, for you springer fishermen and ladies, if you're going out there to dig clams, you might as well take a sand shrimp gun and gun mm. up all the sand shrimp you want out there on the beaches. That too is completely legal and you save yourself a ton of money simply by grabbing your own sand shrimp when mm -hmm. uh, you are already there. So yeah. two for one. Anyway, uh, hey, we had a link out opener May we 1st. Did. Out here in Puget Sound. And for those paying attention on social media, looks like in some areas and for some folks, uh, some of the regulars out there, yep. they're doing pretty well, mopping up. Yeah, so what I saw, you know, and, and the reports that I got is if you could find the right live bait, mm -hmm. you know, that was absolutely key. And from the folks that I talked with, it was like, hey, these Puget Sound Link Cod, at least the ones that we're chasing, you know, in Area 9, they don't like the the Mondo flounder, which is the first time I, you know, that's the first time I'd ever heard that. You know me, I don't yeah. like I don't like using flounder, period, for live no. bait. But if you have to, it works really well out of Westport. Don't get me wrong. Yes, it does. But if I've got the option for Puget Sound between a live herring uh -huh. or a live shiner perch, yep. I'm going that route every single time. And the folks that I talked to that had that option or the smaller flounder, they did pretty darn good. Sure, did yeah, pretty darn good. Yeah, I too like the shinier bait. For Puget yep. Sound, um, yep. as we have personally experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, our buddy Matt, he likes to go after the shiny bait as well, though he said this year it's been tough. He's not seen a whole lot of the little yeah. pogies or the, shine, or the pile perch. Right. So, you know, if you're able to find schools of bait, go out there and Zabiki rig up some fresh herring. Right. It's a great alternative. It, and I want to propose a different alternative to folks that are having, you know, herring are hard to track down sometimes. Yes. Shiner perch, you may go to your favorite dock and you look down and there's three of them hanging out by the piling and then you spend an hour trying to get those three <laughs> perch right off the get piling. Those three, yeah. um, the, the, <laughs> the easier alternative, I will say, is to pull sculpin up or bullhead. Yeah. You know, the little yep. sculpin, the little staghorn sculpin. And a lot of them. And there is a lot of them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the, the, the ones that are about four or five inches mm -hmm. are absolutely perfect for link cod bait. They're lively, they're aggressive. You know what works and, great uh, for those? Link cod love them. Uh, mussels. Yep. Mussels or clam necks work just, really well. Clam necks work great. Yep. And if you if you don't want to take time to do all that, just get some of your little uh, tiger prawn because it's a tough, durable bait. Yep. It's white. It actually has some uh, um, some uh, UV properties to it yep. when it goes down in the water and it grabs sunlight. Those little uh, those little shrimp from the grocery store work fantastic. Yep. But mussels are just a natural go-to. Yeah. They, well, in my childhood, that was my childhood. Go down yeah. to the dock, go down and to the fish, boat to work on the boat heads, yeah. and, you know, lay down on the dock, reach yep. your hand over the side yep. and grab a handful of mussels and crack them open and use them. So the lake yeah. cod fishery will continue. Um, sounds like a good number of bottom, you know, uh, rockfish and stuff getting caught out there too. You yeah. Know, which yellow, is great. Yellowtail are making a comeback. It's nice yeah. to see. We can't keep them yet. So don't make that mistake. Right. But, uh, yeah. Get and then out just there. friendly reminder on that note, you got to have a descent device if you're fishing bottom fish. So do not 100%. forget that. All right, we're going to jump out of here. First half of the show complete if you're joining us here on Root Sports. Uh, if uh, you're joining us here live tonight, stick through the break. Second half of the show coming up right after this. Allied, the new leader in heavy gauge aluminum boats. Allied boats have standard reverse chine and lifting rakes to help you plane faster and run at lower RPMs. Allied boats have several models to choose from, ranging from a 19-foot Mustang all the way up to a 32-foot Liberator. 
So regardless of what type of heavy gauge aluminum boats you are looking for, Allied Boats will have it for you. Contact Allied Boats today to learn more about these incredible fishing machines. Hey guys, I'm Big Mike. Come on down to the Edge Pro Shop and see me. We've got all the best brands under one roof. We've got Hawken, Procure, Short Bus, Pro Troll, Yakima Bait, Get Em Dry Jigs, Northwest Bait Scent, Daiwa Reels, North Fork Lures, North Wild, Brad's, Superfly, Rocky Mountain Tackle, and of course, the greatest rods ever built, Edge Rods. Hey, welcome back to Fish on Northwest. I'm Tommy Donlin, and we are in the Bait Lab, brought to you by Sportco and Outdoor Emporium. All right, this is a topic that I probably should have covered a couple years ago, but it is an absolutely deadly rig. It's a double rig, okay, to catch link cod. And the thing that you're gonna love about this is it's absolutely scalable. And what I mean by that is it doesn't matter if you're fishing in 700 feet of water or 30 feet of water, okay? And so what is a double rig? And effectively, a double rig, and again, the one that I'm gonna show you tonight is really rigged for kind of that deep water application. And so I've got, you know, a sizable pipe jig, okay? This one is about two and a half to three pounds. And then you're gonna notice that it comes up to a three-way swivel. So I've got about, I'm gonna call that maybe three and a half feet of line that goes from the pipe jig all the way up to the swivel. And on this three-way swivel, I've got another foot to a foot and a half that comes off the other end, and then I've got your famed power grub, okay? And so if we go to the table, I'm gonna walk you through each one of these components, kind of talk about them in detail. So the first thing I wanna do is talk about the pipe jig. Um, now I do all of these myself because I have a particular way that I like them rigged. And um, the first thing you're gonna notice is the pipe itself. So this copper pipe is three quarter inch, okay? And just to give you a rough idea, if you make this roughly nine inches in length, you're gonna have a two pounder. You make it about uh, 12 or so, you're gonna have about a three pounder, okay? Now you're gonna notice that in this pipe jig, and uh, I've got some pretty heavy stainless steel cable in here. That's 500 pound stainless steel cable that you'll see on a lot of the commercial salmon boats for trolling. That cable goes all the way down into the shank of this pipe before I pour the lead, okay? Now, before I pour the lead, I also insert this swivel right here. That's a 250 pound swivel. Um, you can go up from there, but you really don't need to. That's connected to this, um, to this cable right here. And then the other thing that's covered up by shrink wrap is a stainless steel cotter pin, a heavy duty cotter pin. Now that goes in, and the reason that you put that through the middle of the pipe is because you gotta connect this 500 pound barrel swivel. Yes, 500 pounds. Now the reason for that is because these link cut are mean, and you never know when you're gonna have a 100 pound halibut come up and hammer the pipe, and they do. So heavy duty, heavy duty barrel swivel, heavy duty half inch split ring, and then you've got your 12 watt Mustad Duratin treble. Now, when you create these yourself, you really wanna size this treble hook so that it doesn't go above the pipe, the top of the pipe, or below the bottom of the pipe, right? This one is kinda of right, right at the border, but you don't wanna hang this you know, on the bottom and you don't wanna hang it on the line. So that's kind of the sizing. So you pick kind of that midpoint in the jig, and then um, I did a poor job on this one, but I got some shrink wrap over it to try to hide um, the ends of the cotter pin too. And I'm sure that you're all more qualified than I am to do the, uh, to do the heat shrinking part. So um, I trust your ability. Okay, now the next thing you're gonna know if you go back to the table is you're gonna see the San Diego knot. And you guys know this is like one of my favorite knots. Super strong knot, that's what that knot is. In fact, every knot in this, tire, in this entire rig is a San Diego knot. So if I come up the line, again, three and a half feet, you're gonna see this heavy duty three-way swivel. This is a commercial fishing swivel. Um, this is an eight aught, eight aught swivel, um, rated for approximately 600 pounds, really heavy duty, okay? So I've got 250 pound, and in this case, it's Berkeley Big Game. I also use 300 pound line, and I can still tie this knot uh, with great effect. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna also walk you through kind of the, the genesis of this rig, but I'm using mono for sure. 
Okay, and then off the other side, you've got about a foot and a half of that 250 pound mono, and that's gonna come over to my absolute favorite hook, which is this guy right here. This is your Gamakatsu Big River Hook in 12 aught. Okay, 12 aught is the way to go. Super strong, super thin, penetrates well into the jaw of a halibut or a link cod. And then what I'm doing is I'm threading a power grub on there, a Berkeley power grub. Um, I like really two colors. I like white and I like um, glow uh, out of, uh, you know, out of uh, Westport. We've also had some really good luck with some bigger root beer grubs that work really well. And then in this particular one, I've tipped it with a Yamashita double skirt as well in pearl white. Okay. And that's basically the rig. That's the rig. Now, where did this rig start? Okay. This rig, I learned about this rig or a variation of this rig back in 2007. Okay. And it was absolutely doing work back then. Where this rig started, and the reason I'm telling you is because you can choose if you decide, you can rig it this way as well. So a little bit different application, but you've got a, a jig head here, okay, 24 ounce. And then you're gonna notice I've got, I've got tuna cord. I've got tuna cord here. This is 200 pound test tuna cord. This is how I started rigging this. Now you go, well, okay, you're doing mono now. You started with tuna cord. Why, why did you switch to mono, okay? There's less water resistance on the mono, so you're gonna have a little bit less blowback, but also it's not as noticeable to the fish, okay? And when there is pick bites, picky bites, and there will be, even though it's a halibut and a link cod, they do get picky, you're gonna see, you know, dropping down from the 250 down to the 150, but you'll never see me really go below a 100 pound test mono uh, for fishing because we do have large halibut in the state. Just a couple years ago, a buddy of mine caught a 185 pounder. Um, and so those big fish do, do exist, okay? Um, so just looking at this, just to kind of give you an idea, and this was what I call, you know, the poor man's rig, but it was very simple. So I've got tuna cord with a cinch knot, comes up, the swivel that goes to the main line is sliding on the tuna cord. And then I've just got a couple beads. And then I just very simply put one overhand knot right in the middle of the line. And that sets the length for my other rig with the 12 watt uh, Gamakatsu Big River Hook. And um, this brings up a good point. So you don't just use power grubs all the time. I really, really, really like the big hammer, you know, for, for really everything, for inshore fishing, for link cod and sea bass, obviously for tuna, big hammer is my go-to, but this is the nine inch glow big hammer um, and this thing does a lot of work at depth as well. Okay, so this was kind of the original ring, uh, rig made with tuna cord. Uh, I'll show you another variation of this. Uh, there's a gentleman that, that has a company called uh, Bad Donkey Jigs, and that's what you're looking at here, this jig head. Um, super strong hook in these jigs, great jig. And in this case, I've taken that nine inch big hammer and I've rigged it onto the jig head. Um, again, this is not uh, as heavy as a jig head. You're talking about about a 16 ouncer in this case. And that's kind of what I was getting to in terms of scalability. Now, one of the things that I'm gonna point out as I go to the table on this rig here is you're gonna look at the knot and you're gonna see three tag ends on the top of the knot right here. And you're gonna wonder what the heck's going on. So when you do drop down in your monofilament, if you do go to um, kind of that 100 pound or 130 pound or whatever the case may be, I tie a double San Diego. So I double the line and then tie the San Diego knot, okay? You can do this with your other cinch knots as well, but that gives you just a little bit extra assurance. If you're really worried about this connection here, you really wanna drop down in the line, tie a TN knot, Tango November knot, okay? Super strong knot. Um, the other thing is you're going to notice this rig has been used. Look at the power grub on this sucker. This thing has been absolutely mauled. You can see teeth marks, the tail's missing. Um, you know, the one thing I will say about the power grubs is they make them with real bait sense. Okay. And you can see on this one, I've even had to put a zip tie in place to keep this thing together. Another trick of the trade is to use heat shrink. If you can get heat shrink over the top of a swim bait, that'll kind of keep it together. You can shrink it down. I would recommend the large size, one inch diameter, right? And it shrinks to a third of the size. So you really get a lot of good compression there. And you can save those swim baits that you pay anywhere from a dollar and a half 
all the way up to you know three or four dollars per swim bait so that's a good way to save your bait if you're on the water you don't have a heat gun handy you're going to use a zip tie it's a great way to go okay so i want to that's that's one thing i want to mention in terms of scalability you know the other thing that's really good is you can do this and you've seen us do this before inshore fishing 60 feet of water 70 feet of water two and a half ounce jig head right 30 pound 40 pound monofilament we're doing the same exact rig same exact rig right now the other thing instead of having a three-way swivel you can go to the top and you can put a dropper loop or an overhand knot and that's going to be your your top loop and then instead of say a power grub or something that size we use a shrimp fly so so this rig is totally scalable now you always have to remember the regulations when you're talking about a double rig in the state of washington you can have two hooks that's it if you have two hooks, that pretty much limits you to two baits. If you're in Canadian waters, no matter what, you cannot have more than one offering, one bait. But you can have one bait with 12 hooks if you so decide. There's no limit to the hooks, but there is, you cannot have a double rig in Canada. What I'm showing you tonight is illegal in Canada. You can't do it, so just kind of keep that in mind. Um, something else that I want to talk about is you may look at this and you go, okay, that's great, but I fish four people on my boat. I fish six people on my boat. I don't want to store a bunch of pipe jigs in a bucket with all of this line and then an extra hook. It's going to get tangled. It's going to rust in the bucket. It's going to sit in the boat, right? And so I want to make this modular. I want to make it, you know, something that I can break down and store easier. Now, if I go back to the table, I'll show you effectively what you would do. And then I'm going to tell you why I don't do this. But first, I want to show you what you could do. So this connection to the pipe jig, because let's face it, pipe jigs are a pain in the butt to store. You got a giant treble hook, you know, obviously with three points that wants to do nothing more than stick you in the hand or leg or whatever. And so what you could do is you could get a really heavy duty snap swivel and you could put that in line instead of tying direct to the pipe jig. Okay. That way you can unhook the pipe jig. You can store the pipe jig separately from the rest of the line, the rest of the rig kind of keep them separate and stow them now here's the deal i do not trust i do and my crew my crew absolutely hates it i don't trust snap swivels i don't like snap swivels okay and this goes for a lot of different fisheries if we're fishing swordfish that leader gets crimped on that last five and a half seven feet of actual leader with the swordfish bait on it it gets crimped on it does not get put on with a swivel because these do fail with big fish right and, and over time, they also corrode, right? Saltwater is not a friendly en environment to any metal. And um, you, you know, unless you're constantly changing these out, which I know you're not gonna do, right? I'm not gonna do it either. Um, it is a failure point. And I, as an engineer, I like as few of failure points as possible. So that's why you'll see me tie direct for a lot of my gear. Spreader bars, same thing. I really am not a fan of these. Um, crew hates it though, because you get hung on the bottom, you got to break off, you got to retie. If you're in a six to eight foot sea with a you know 15 to 20 knot wind, it's not fun as you're sitting there trying to do a double San Diego knot. So you can understand why it may be unpopular. So just kind of keep that in mind, you know, as you're going out for that day of fishing. There's some of these nuances to consider. One of the other things that I will mention, and I got a another nice piece of metal here is this is a soft croc and this is a Norwegian cod jig, okay, is what you're looking at. If I go to the table, show you a little bit more a detail. Uh, you know, most of my crew is afraid to fish this just because they're not cheap, but these rigs are highly, highly, highly effective. This is a 1000 gram, AKA 35 ounce jig um, with a nice piece of fluorescent tubing on the, on the treble hook. And the one thing that I will say about this is these are just so deadly effective. They got some pretty mean, sharp facets on them. And this jig, when you work it through the water column, it has a really wide swing to it, okay? Super erratic. So if you have fish that just really aren't willing to cooperate, or if they're on a lot of herring, you know, or those bigger sardines or pilchards or whatnot, they're on those big baits, big shiny baits, and you're really trying to get their attention, this jig is the way to go. So when things slow down, maybe the current is what I want it to be, and I'm really trying to aggravate the fish, I'll go to this Norwegian jig, and you can run it on a double rig as well. All right, covered A to Z on the double rig. 
I hope you use it. It's deadly effective. You get halibut and link on on both. The bottom, the top rig, the grub, the swim bait, the pipe jig, the Norwegian jig. You get it on absolutely everything, okay? Super deadly effective. Okay, don't go anywhere. We're gonna be right back after the short break on Fish Hunt Northwest. All Defiance boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why all boats are backed with a lifetime warranty. All Defiance boats come standard with large fish boxes that are fully insulated so that you can ice your fish properly all day. All Defiance boats are foam flotation filled and unsinkable for the ultimate in safety while fishing offshore. Before you buy any boat, stop by or call Defiance boats today to ensure you are getting the very best glass boat your money can buy. If you're looking for the best fishing rods in the world, you really do need to take a look at the edge rods. I designed and built new machinery, and I think this new machinery has enabled us to build blanks like no other company can build without this equipment. There is no other rods in the world that are as good as these rods. You owe it to yourself to take a good look at them. New days, new beginnings, new friends, new loves, new dreams, new goals, new scenery, new job. No matter what the next chapter holds, Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate will be there to help you find the new that's right for your lifestyle at any stage of your life. Better Homes and Gardens Real Estate. Expect better. All right, welcome back here in the studio. Nicely done, mister. Thank you, sir. That was very well in depth. Yeah, and just, just to answer, I do not like putting any hoochie on the pipe jig itself. Mm. Um, I like I like the pipe jig sleek, and I like it to move fast. And the other thing is, if I put a small hoochie on that on that hook, mm -hmm. it just it seems to get targeted by smaller fish. Oh, yeah. And so I just don't do it. Yeah. Uh, it's one thing if you're adding it to a grub that's already up there to kind of you know, make that profile bigger of that bait, mm -hmm. but not the pipe jig. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, and Clayton, no, uh, we did not fish the halibut opener today. Tommy was at work, and um, I uh, typically do not hit the ocean on a lengthy day on a Thursday. <laughs> but we have to be back in here and ready to go, you know, around 5 o'clock. But so. this Saturday is a different story. This Saturday is a different story. That's right. We're going to get to that. Um, before we do, a little recap. Uh, as you were out there galley event around the ocean, mm -hmm. having a good time and chasing sea creatures, uh, Matthew Messing and I headed to the east side, did a little fishing, took the boat, and let me tell you, um, I need to start writing down lists. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm getting old. But when you plan to take the boat and do full on couple of days of fishing, and then oh, you're just going to drop yeah. everything, checklist, switch gears, yeah, for hunting, yeah. There's there's a lot. Of I packing. haven't sent you my list. I don't need your. I've list. got I've got, got Excel lists. spreadsheets. One yeah, for hunting, one yeah, for fishing. You know how many little, tabs yeah. I have so, for each one. Anyway, got to be prepared. Uh, fishing was okay. We didn't get into nearly as many fish as we wanted to, and definitely no kokanee. Troy was out there killing it, of course, as he does. Um, and, uh, but the weather was good. The wind wasn't, well, day two, the wind was horrible, but uh, it is what it is. Uh -huh. You just fish. Yeah. And uh, we got some nice sized triploids, that is for sure. Um, just not the numbers that I would like to think we could get, you know? So and you guys were, were kokanee fishing, right? Well, I mean, it's, there's an abundance of the triploids, and if you get a bonus kokanee, you're going to get a bonus kokanee. I historically have always done better over there. Once we get into June, they drop a little deeper. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can target them on the wire 40, 50 feet, something like that. Mm -hmm. I seem to find more kokanee mm -hmm. that time That's of year. That's when they start dropping water, right? And kind of. That's when they start raising water. Water's coming or, up now. Or, excuse me, raise water's water. Water's right? coming up. Snow yeah. melt. So yeah. they've drained it down like 50 feet. Yeah. Anticipating snow but is that is that when the fish typically congregate closer to the dam? So when they draw the water down, the fish congregate down towards the dam. Okay, and they fill it up and they can be down. anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. They fill okay. it up, they just they spread out. The feed spreads gotcha. out, they spread out. So gotcha. that's when you lean on fishing those bays the direction from the day before that the wind was pushing. Right. Because all your feed is yep. going to be in those bays, right? Sure. So anyway, a little method to the madness, but uh, we did all right. It's just, um, you know, uh, got out of fishing mindset, dropped the boat, and headed to the turkey cabin. Mm -hmm. Right? Eric Broughton, friend of ours, and uh, on the show on a regular basis. Uh, and we talk about this. We actually did a segment with him talking about the history of the turkey cabin. Yes. Because, Tommy, let's face it, uh, hunting camp, 
um, elk camp, deer camp, mm -hmm. turkey cabin. I mean, sir, you're so <laughs> dedicated that you have a cabin yes. specific, and it is truly for turkey hunting, right? Yes. The history there, man, I slept there uh, a couple nights uh, while we're hunting out in that particular area. Um, that being said, we put a couple hundred miles on a day in the old Chevy. Uh, mm -hmm. I think Eric has 300,000 miles on this truck. I mean, it is just, mm. you just go. It's the turkey truck. It is the turkey truck. It's yeah. a it's a brush beater. It's a uh, Matt found a uh, a moose paddle. Oh, he did. Small, okay. Small. Okay. But uh, nonetheless, his first one. So Very he's pretty cool. excited on Very a shed cool. hunt. Um, but you know the turkey hunt in itself. Like we got out there late afternoon on Friday, and we plan to get out, hit the evening time, go find mm -hmm. some birds, put them to roost, do the whole deal, kind of have a game plan for day two, which was truly day one of hunting. Right. But we did get on a couple uh, spot and stocks that evening, which was great, you know, found found smaller groups of uh, birds with, you know, we had one group there, there was a ton of hens and probably five toms out there strutting around on some private land. And and so you're, you're taking in all this information and, you know, trying to go into your first full day of hunting with a plan. And, um, and it's gonna be Saturday, so we're gonna be up against the hunters in the woods. And yeah, right, right. Um, so we opted, we started off in the morning on a ground blind set that Eric had already set up on some property and I was successful and that's the, that's the infamous backflip. That's where that, that, that's all, right. that all went down yeah. a couple years ago. So we started the morning there. As soon as we're getting out of the truck and daylight's just starting to bust, the, the gobblers are gobbling in the trees, they're jumping out of roost. Um, nothing, man, we're there till 7 a.m. Never had a bird come up the hill, come into that area, nothing. So we abandoned that plan, got on the road, we headed north. And uh, we were pulling off frequently, and Eric's using his locator call. He's mm -hmm. waylaying on the old, uh, the woodpecker. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hacking away on the, uh, the crow call, uh, which he looks at me and goes, yeah, you got to work on that. So oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Didn't use the old truck horn, huh? No, no, didn't use the old truck horn or the, yeah. uh, the hinge point on the suspension, <laughs> right? So um, spot and stock, calling, try to get some, uh, you know, get up in the woods, put a, put a, put a chase on a few. Mm -hmm. Um, Eric kept uh, coming back to the fact in certain areas because of the way the weather has been this year, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. So the farther north you go, the colder it still is. Yep. And so the birds are just breaking out of their fall and winter groups. Okay. And thereby, as they start dispersing out and breaking up into smaller groups. Now these toms are be becoming protective of their hens. Yeah. So they got a group of hens, three, four, five, six, whatever sure. it is and you find a couple toms working a field and you pull off and come up around behind them and try to draw right. them, get the decoy out, try to draw them to you with your calls, mm -hmm. they're very reluctant right now to leave their hens. Mm -hmm. Now, as we progress over the next couple of weeks, it's gonna warm up, the hens are gonna be bred, a lot of them will start nesting. Yep. Once they're committed to nesting and they don't leave except for one hour a day to eat and take care of business because they don't take care of business on the eggs, right? They do it all in one shot out there for about an hour, then they're right back to the nest. Um, that's when you can start pulling toms because mm -hmm. now they're looking. Because they're, they're trying to breed the, those ones that didn't get bred. Or yeah. looking for new ones to breed, yes, yeah. because they're out there, right? Now they got to find them. So a little more aggressive in responding to your call. So, so what do they do? So if you got, okay, when they're, you know, they've got their harem, so to speak, yep. they've got their hens. Yep. They don't want to leave their hens. Yep. You, are you calling with hen calls? Yep. Are you calling with, yes? Yeah, you're, 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 uh, no you're gobbles. It got desperate times, produced desperate measures, and yeah. Eric does have a gobble call. It's a shaker. It's a, it's like a shaker. So what happens? You said they got their hands. <laughs> like you gobble. Shaker. They're like, hey, girls, we got to go. They take them and leave, or what? No, happened? well, no? so I can't really specify on that because we didn't observe that behavior. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the few times that he executed the gobble call, so ninety nine point nine percent of the time, it's it's hand talk, right? Okay. It's clucks. It's uh, it's scrapes. It's yeah. purrs. It's it's just all those dynamics to try okay. to get hens attention you start drawing hens on over to say hey what's going on and then toms will hopefully follow yeah sure so we ended up going up into the hills we're up about 3,000 feet and uh in the rocky hills rocky terrain and there's a blind set up and we're going to go camp in this blind now keep in mind first good week of weather change substantial mm -hmm. weather change we're highs of 80 degrees over there oh that's warm yeah the afternoon uh activity is mm -hmm. is kind of getting now that 10 a.m to 2 p.m window yeah that they're really starting to probably shift towards now was just at the start of that and we got set up, put some deeks out, 
And the first thing that happens is we get a tom and three hens way on the periphery. They just kind of come up over and they kept their distance. They were just out there. They were staying in the shade is mm -hmm. what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'd get a lone hen coming in once in a while. We had one hen that was there with us most of the day. She'd be in and out, come back, mm -hmm. and very comfortable, right? And, and Eric was swapping out decoys. He'd put out the Jake. He'd put out the hen. He'd put out the Jake and the Does, hen. Doesn't he have like a actual decoy that he he's... He has. Last year, he made a yeah. Jake decoy out of a Jake. Yes. <laughs> He came to the a Jake <laughs> and stuffed it. And uh, I asked him, what did you stuff that with? He goes, oh, there's a story. And he started, because he actually took some taxidermy mm -hmm. in college, right? And so okay. he, he kind of understands the basics of it. But, um, yeah, that thing turned out great. And it got pulverized last year. Them Toms attacked that Jake decoy. Oh, they screwed it up. They huh? just, oh, they just, yeah, talons Buggers. in the back. So um, we set up, and we knew we were in for the rest of the day. Because mm -hmm. we were, I was banking on, and we're kind of all, you know, we're all three in there, in this blind. Matt's trying to capture this all on film. Did a phenomenal job as it all came together. And, you know, we'd get those hens coming in. Uh, we're waiting for the cooling temps and the shade to start dropping down. You know, you got to get out of that doggone blind once in a while and stretch. I don't Pretty know. Pretty warm, huh? Well, it was warm. And in the fall time, when I'm hunting deer, if I go to sit in a blind, yeah. you know, it's an all-day deal, in at dark, out at dark. Yeah. You're 10, 11 hours, depending. Um, you got to get up and move around, man. So you had, you had three guys in a one-man blind? It was, uh, it's a it's a good-sized blind. Yeah, there's plenty Oh, of, it's a good-sized blind. Yeah, okay, it's, it's, okay. Yeah, just, just checking. Don't even go there. So <laughs> we uh, we all stepped out about 6 o'clock, stretched a little, walked around a little, tried to, you know, tried to reset. Okay, let's give it an hour, right? We're going to give it an hour. We go back in there, and we're in there 15, 20 minutes. Okay. This hen comes back, and she is just not having it with that decoy <laughs> she is strutting around d ducking and dodging throwing i mean just a little floyd May mayweather yeah, action going oh yeah, on. yeah yeah it was yeah. it was hilarious and i can't wait till matt puts that to music because it's going to be quite the dance show but that being said she's doing her thing and matt's sitting over here and i can't see on the left the left periphery and he's like hey there's a tom finally coming in we got a big mm -hmm. tom coming in and that bird came strutting in unannounced never gobbled never not once never made a noise fanned out the whole time Yes, just after he crested right over the little hill there, boom, he's up and he's just strutting on in and he's so plump and he's he's wobbling. Actually, yeah. Eric called him Mr. Wobbles doesn't gobbles, right? He just comes, <laughs> comes walking on in there and um, he's making a beeline for that, that hen decoy. Right. And, you know, they keep it like in their sights. And yep. so they're either going to come straight and go head to head or else they're going to strut around and do it so... As it gets over here in in position, I got my my 410 right there with that red dot. And uh -huh. I I put that red dot right on the ear hole, man. Put it on the ear hole, can't miss. And so if you can see ear hole, you need to be pulling the trigger. Yeah, right. And so he's just so what range are we talking here? He was 20 to 25. Okay. Well, not too bad. This okay. gun, I feel comfortable with this gun. Uh, 80% of that 9.5 TSS load. Yeah, the tungsten. Yeah. Yep. Um, Downrange, 40 yards. 10, 10 inch pipe plate. Okay. Is the factory okay. specs. Okay. And so we did some we did some targeting at Turkey Camp, checked our patterns, we're good. High high percentage of everything in the head and neck, right where you yeah. want to be. So uh, I had no doubts. Um, but as it gets closer, you got to be more exact because now you've got a tighter pattern. Yeah, you got right? a tighter pattern. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, 25 to 30 yards is a real comfortable distance. Okay. That stuff performs, I think, probably optimally. It's it's 12. 50 per second, you know, it's it's moving. That's fast, yeah. And it doesn't uh, deform in shape, right? It holds its, sure, it, yeah, right. it stays tight pattern. So, um, yeah, got the uh, got the red dot on the ear hole. Eric's like, now. And I didn't squeeze off, I waited. He's going, <laughs> what are you doing? And he what turns, are you doing? He turns a little bit, and I'm like, oh, now, okay, boom. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, a good headshot with that TSS load, man, that bird was down. And you, you kind of... You work all day. I mean, look at that thing, right? The colors yeah. of that bird, the size of that bird. And when it comes in, you don't really gauge, like, what it is. It's like, hey, there's a nice tom. You're trying to do your job. There's yeah. a nice tom. You don't have time yeah. to go, I wonder how big its spurs are. I wonder all the, yeah. I call it the turkey spec geeks, right? Yeah, they, it's, not, it's not like grading a bull from 700 no, yards no. plus away. It's yeah. like, that's a nice tom. We've worked all day. We're almost seven hours in the blind. This is why yeah. we're here. Pull the trigger. Go out. Uh, Eric, who is so immersed into the turkey hunting for years, right? Mm -hmm. First thing he starts looking at is the size of this bird, beard, spurs, 
he was like, oh my gosh, look at the size of these spurs. What, what does it matter what size the spurs are? Right. Well, if you truly understand turkey hunting, these mountain merriams, look, uh, three quarter inch spur, pretty much normal, rounded, up in the rocks, rugged. Right, they're, they're, they're grinding them down. They're grinding them down. Yeah. These ones, he could tell right away, they're nice and pointy and they're pretty lengthy. We get back to camp, uh. he, it's, you know, because all the, all the stats go on the wall. Uh, inch and a quarter, inch and an eighth. On the spurs. Yeah. So was he was he corn fed? Would you say, mm. or you know, hanging out in the? He may have found a farm or two. On the farm, you know. <laughs> yeah. Eric gauges that bird to be four or five years old. Very much okay. a bird. Okay. Probably has uh, mated with a lot of hens over the last couple of years yeah. in their maturity from three years on, and yeah. um, uh, just a spectacular bird. And he was like, "Hey, man, if uh, if I was you, I would seriously think about getting this thing taxidermy." I'm like, mm-hmm. "Really." Really, mm-hmm. you know? But when you look at the colors on that bird, as mm-hmm. Jordan had put it up, the waddle, the the, the length of the snood, I mean, yeah. just the dominance of this bird, I'm like, yep. you know, you're right. Mm-hmm. This bird deserves respect. And we worked hard for that bird. Yeah, and you did. There's a That's lot, a long time in a blind. It's a long time in a blind. Yeah. But you know, as well as I, as anybody that's passionate about any type of hunting, the overall story of the day yeah. and how it all comes together, right. that's, what we, that's what we hold on to. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And it was a team effort. Matt did a phenomenal job. I can't wait to watch this as a segment on the show, as an episode. Yeah. It's going to be great. Um, so, yeah, just a couple days of, you know, grinding, hard work, ultimately in a blind, all comes together. And uh, we're heading back here this next week for three days. Um, we'll try to film some, but mostly Matt and I got a couple tags to still fill. Yeah. And uh, Unfinished business. We're just going to be out there on the old public land and uh, hoping those toms are a little more... Uh, eager to play and yeah. see if we can't go get a couple more. So that one's going to the taxidermy here in a couple weeks. Perfect, and, uh, perfect. In about six to eight months, he's going to be sitting right here. Awesome. <laughs> in studio next to Tommy. There we go. Let's do it. <laughs> Little Tommy. Anyway, it was a great uh, great opportunity. Can't thank Eric Broughton enough. He's always a gracious host. Um, met, a, met a handful of his buddies over there and just had a, just had a great time. Yeah, Tried to get cool. you over there sometime, but we're always up against... Too many things going on. There's always something going on. Too much going on. Yeah. Right? Frozen with indecision. Yeah. As uh, the great one good, would always Good say. problem to have. Good problem to have. So, uh, yeah, going to bring that to you here in a few weeks down the road. Um, I think you guys will enjoy it. Uh, again, Matt did a great job shooting it. His editing skills are second to none. So, okay, uh, we are going to jump out for a quick break. We come back. Tommy, I want to pick your brain on the success of your guys' family outing uh, this last weekend out there at Nia Bay. We'll talk a little bit about the trip you and I are, well, you had had planned, and now all of a sudden I find myself l- right. lured into the event, and we're going to go chase some halibut, so mm-hmm. we'll talk a little bit about that. By the way, while you were doing your bait lab, I was pulling the kokanee and the nice. rain- rainbows out of the nice. freezer back here in the bait lab, so uh, we'll get those in the brine tonight after the show. Can't wait. Perfect. All right, do not go anywhere. We come back and hear all about Tommy and family's outing, getting little ones on the ocean of all places, how to be successful and do it safe and have a great time with the kids. Doing all that, we come back right here, Fish on Northwest. A Northwest favorite for almost 40 years, Arima boats are manufactured with pride in Bremerton, Washington. All Arima boats are built without any structural wood materials. That is why Arima boats are backed with a lifetime warranty. Arima can offer every boat with Honda outboard packages so that you can take advantage of the reliability and five-year top-to-prop warranty from your Honda outboard. Call or stop by Arima Boats today and let them help you get into your very next boat. Yep, for sure. Oh yeah, big fish. Yeah, buddy. Nice fish. Beauty. Gorgeous fish. Bobby's on the board. We got a good one. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, jeez, oh, come on. Nice fish. Nice fish.
All right, welcome back here as we wind it down and close out the show. Uh, tell me if folks are paying attention to uh, your Facebook page and some of the mm-hmm. info we're putting out there on our Facebook page, they would have uh, gathered in some intel that, wow, look at all them little kids and PFDs, and that looks like a really big boat. So yes. talk a little bit about your guys' plan, some of the buddies, uh, mutual buddies that you guys, families headed out for this last weekend, and got these kids introduced to their ocean That's right. fisheries, huh? Yeah, so this started probably, this plan started about a year ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wanted to get, you know, not only my son kind of out on the water, but you know they always have more fun, right, when they have a buddy. And so I was thinking, well, what if we could get, you know, our kids, and then I've got a handful of buddies that have kids the same age, right? Um, you know, I've got a 10-month-old daughter and a three-year-old son, and, uh, you know, funny Mr. Mr. J.J. Dial, <laughs> same same deal, right? He's got yes. a, a one-year-old and a yes, four- or five-year-old. Mm-hmm. Uh, Herb Gutler, another good buddy of mine, same thing, one-year-old, three-year-old. So, um, you know, so this plan came about then, and we were thinking, what if we get the entire family out at Nia Bay, which... You know, if you've never been to Nia Bay, it is it is like the mecca for bottom fishing. Mm-hmm. It has the most rock structure in the state, the most kelp structure in the state. It's nutrient rich. You have bait everywhere. There's fish just readily available, and and all really within a couple miles of the marina. So we we never went further than three miles from the dock. Oh, easiest trip ever, right? And this was by design because I wanted. I wanted to make this trip about the kids, not yeah, the adults, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Because you know how I roll. Oh, if it's up to me, we're going <laughs> yes. around the corner, uh-huh. and we're going to stay out for 15, 16 hours, 18 yeah, hours, yeah. whatever the case is, right? Yep. Yeah. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to put that urge aside, mm-hmm. and we're just going to focus on the kids. Yeah. And so the thought process was, well, hey, we're not going to, when the kids are ready to go out in the morning, we'll go out. We're not going to wake them up at 5, uh, even though my son gets up at 5. Uh, I wonder where he gets that from. Weird. And then, uh, you know, we're just going to go when everybody's ready, and yep. when they're done, we're done, yeah. right? And that's exactly what we did. So that's we hit, a great approach. We hit the water around yeah. 10, yeah. right? And, um, you know, we fish spots that were extremely close. And, and one thing that I want to just mention to everybody is that it doesn't take much to catch fish out of Nia Bay. Right. So Wada Island's the first island that you come across. You go out of the marina, you take a right, boom, Wada Island is right there. Wada's got kelp, they got rocks. Um going back to the live bait thing okay you can drift that rock pile and drift that rock pile and that that water island gets hit by 15 boats a day every day every hour of the day but if you have live bait the link cod that sat there and watched jig go by jig go by jig go by as soon as the first live bait crosses that link cod's face boom it is game on <laughs> the game on. okay so we had kind of gone down down third beach which is just to the right of Wada, just to the mm-hmm. south and caught a whole bunch of greenling and small bass, took them over to Wada Island, and dropped on rock piles right off Wada, on the south end of Wada, no. not even off the north end, okay? Uh-huh. So I'm, you can see the marina from where we are fishing, yeah. okay? It is right there. Yeah. First first one down, yep. live bait, gets inhaled by a link cod, okay? First one down. First one down. Bring, bring that one up, you know, and then here's the other thing with kids, right? You just have to be patient, and you have to... You have to tell yourself, no matter what happens, I'm not going to get excited, mm-hmm. right? So did we break a couple rods? Yes, we broke a couple rods. Really? Absolutely. It's just <laughs> it's part of the process. It's you just, kids. You know it's going to happen, uh-huh. right? We broke a couple rods, and you're going to lose fish, yeah. right? And um, you're going to have tangles. You're going to have, mm-hmm. you know, mistakes are going to be made. But, but you know, the thing about kids is they're watching you 100% of the time. Yeah. And so your your reaction dictates the outcome of how each little minor event goes, mm-hmm. right? And so the parents were awesome on this trip. We just kept our cool. So that first link cod that came up that was about 23, 24 pounds, um, there was another line on top of it, got it 10 feet below the boat. That link cod realized there was another line on top of it, felt it, took off, ripped the hook out, right? Game over. Eh. Did it again, caught another, another link cod, yeah. and another link cod, yeah. right? And so, you know, it was unfortunate, but the bass really weren't playing the game. Mm. We got mostly greenling and then turned those into link cod. Yeah. And so a lot of, a lot of link cod action, not so much on the bass, which is fine. I'd rather have link cod than bass all day. But those kids, you know, for, for most of them, it was the first time they'd ever seen a link cod. Yeah. And if you're a child and you see a link cod and it is, <laughs> it is only a five-pound link cod. Right. And it is, you know, two-thirds the length of your body. And you look at this creature that looks like a gremlin. 
Or a dinosaur. Or a dinosaur, yeah. and you look into his mouth, uh -huh. right? And they could fit both hands into a Lincod's mouth uh -huh. if they tried, uh -huh. and it's it's lined with razor sharp teeth. Yeah. I always wondered, like, do they have nightmares about catching <laughs> this fish, right? It's like, what did I just and, do? And they, you know, the thing is, is they can, t they, they're sitting there, they're reeling on mm -hmm. these rods, and they know something that they've never seen is on the other line. So up. their excitement level is absolutely oh, through yeah. the roof. They have no clue what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the parents are screaming because I, I, told, I, I told all the parents, <laughs> the parents ahead of time. I'm like, hey, we are going to celebrate every <laughs> single thing that happens on the boat, right? right? We want our kids to be hooked on the same passion that we all grew up and got hooked on. Yep. Okay. Yep. And so we celebrated every single moment on the boat. And when those kids had enough of the fishing, and I'm going to be honest with you, the weather was a little nautical at times. When they had enough, we went back, went to the beach right at Hobuck. We had we rented cabins there. We flew kites on the beach. Yeah. We, uh, you know, we made sand castles. We even did a polar plunge. I, I saw I that. Told the told the dads, I'm like, hey, I saw that. We need to make sure after push-ups. Yes, after push-ups, I said we need to make sure that the kids understand. The role of the man, what men should be made of. You're all doing a polar plunge with me, <laughs> well, and, and before be before we do a polar uh, plunge, you're awesome. doing. You're, I try to make it 50 push-ups. Did JJ do that? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. He's in the video. Oh, I, I tried. I said. I tried I to set the. Him. I tried to t get everybody to do 50 push-ups. They said, ha, "No, no, we're not doing 50." I said, "Okay, well, fine, 25." So we did 25 push-ups, sprinted into the ocean. Sean even did 25. And spent. He did. He did. Spent about five minutes in the ocean. It's cold for about the first minute, yeah, and then it's kind of freaky. You don't feel it. I don't yeah, know if that's a good thing or a numb. bad thing. It's probably because right. you're going numb. <laughs> it's like you're um, done. You're Josh completed. won that contest. He was in there for about a good eight, ten minutes. Oh, that kid's nuts. Yeah. So no, it was a phenomenal trip. We're gonna make it a yearly event. That's and, awesome. And again, I would urge any other parents to go to Nia Bay and do the same thing. There's a lot of protected water there, which is why I decided to go there. Yeah. And. Uh, I would just put it out that if any of the parents want my advice, help, you want to meet up with us, I'm more than happy to help anybody go do this. Well, I mean, credit to you and great planning and all parents, you know, on the same page. Hey, it's about the kids. Mm -hmm. We're going to have plenty of fishing days where we're going to catch and lose fish and get big fish and have our victories and have our losses, uh, fight weather, do the whole thing we do as adults. But mm -hmm. this is about the kids and yep. perfect example of how to get it done. Plus, everybody's in PFDs. Everybody's safe. Yes. You don't take risks. You don't take chances. You know, if you guys would have hooked and lost every fish of the day, it didn't matter. It didn't matter. It yep. didn't matter. Exactly. But the exposure those kids got, the experience, the education mm -hmm. to see what's beneath the surface. Yes. I mean, eye-opening for yeah. them first yes. time. And you're right. They may have nightmares. Who knows? It's yeah. like a sea creature. Yes. Right? So. Well, and, you know, and the other thing is, is Nia Bay is just, it's a magical place. You know, fishing aside, mm -hmm. you know, you come into the marina there and you're just, you're just surrounded by these beautiful green hillsides. There's, you know, 20 eagles, bald eagles hanging out on the beach. I mean, it's just some of the most phenomenal scenery that you're ever going to see. Yeah. And so to, to be able to expose them to that at a very early age was, was very special. Yeah, absolutely yeah. worth it. Well, nicely done. Um, <clears throat> okay, you and I, I am joining you and uh, some other uh, folks, other, other guys that you have invited for this weekend. We're going to get some halibut. Yes, we are. And I'm going to have that bait ready to go here by Saturday morning. Heck yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll definitely um, get it done for us. So uh, halibut, Nia Bay, Saturday. That's right. Okay. I gotta uh, work out the logistics with you here after the show, but it's pretty simple. You you get up at midnight and you drive to Nia Bay four hours, and then you, you get, get on a there, boat. You fish for twelve to fourteen hours, uh -huh. and then you drive back. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good logistics. I'm gonna bring a case of uh, rock stars. There you, know, you go. Go. <laughs> so, there you go. There you go. Or monsters, what have you? All right. Uh, great. Uh, great info, Tommy. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yes, we're gonna hit the ocean this weekend. Get out. Go chase some uh, halibut and some uh, some bottom fish. Can't wait. Um, lots to do. Weather is going to turn around here. We've got a couple days where it's uh, blown in here a little bit uh, cruddy again, but that is going to flip here. We're going to get back into some nice weather. I'm actually going to get up tomorrow morning and go springer fishing. Oh, well, I thought you were telling me you're going to go to the gym. No, well, no. It's, you know, I'm going to get up, go That's walk. Okay, I'm going for you. Okay, I had a kid. Somebody's yeah. got to go catch springers. Uh, it's time to put eggs under floats. Yeah. Go walk the shoreline, and I'm also taking a twitching rod, so I'm yeah. pretty excited. Yes. Um, ready to go. Go grab some springers tomorrow. Go uh, go grab some halibut and some bottom fish on Saturday. Mm -hmm. We're going to go get some clams on Sunday. There's just a lot to do. Yeah, that's and then, a busy retirement. And then Matt and I hit the road yeah. on Monday for a turkey hunt for three days. So yeah. another busy week. 
I'm hoping I find time to put a dog on show together next week. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> Thursday will be here before we know it. Hey, I want to thank everybody for tuning in this evening. Uh, we enjoyed it and enjoyed bringing you all the content. Uh, never a shortage of content this time of year. No. And next week's going to be no, no. different. So have a great weekend. Get out and do something. I just listed a uh, number of things that you can take advantage of and get out there and do. Uh, for the next several weeks and months. We got uh, so much happening now as we get into mid-spring here. Things are going to start happening. So get out, enjoy, keep it safe. Thanks for tuning in. We will see you next Thursday right here in studio, 6 p.m., right here at Fish on Northwest.